we're back where we belong, you know. I was excited. I'm excited about that. So maybe everybody else is out in the weather. <laughs> Who knows? We're getting gas. Well, <laughs> maybe we're getting gas. Johnson, you um maybe we should just start. I think so. Oh, oh we're streaming live now. Okay, we have to be really nice now. Okay. You, we've had a weather report. We've had some crumb cake commercials. I think we could go ahead and start <laughs> with open mic now. Okay, let's go ahead and start. And um, Miho, you'll be going first. You were third, but now you're first. So, okay. and um, yeah, so welcome everyone to open mic. And we're going to begin with poet Miho, right? You're going to go first? Yep. All right. <laughs> it's always um, a surprise when you don't know. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm going to read two little poems. One, is a, it's a skinny poem. So it's just a one or two word in one line. And uh, it looks like this. It's supposed to look like a chopstick because <laughs> uh, how do I live without chopsticks? I fold air into eggs and with the same chopsticks, cradle an omelet to one side of a pan to flip. There is no need for a turner, a whisk, a spatula, or heaven forbids, unsightly tongs. Yet when it is only a chopstick, it is a helpless, useless, lonely thing. And uh, next one is um, titled Spring Storm. It's like a sequence of little three line haiku, like little poems. <clears throat> Spring Storm, filled the lost and found with sweaters. Pastel pink dresses electrify in the spring sun. Feeling spring headed. I choose a small handbag. Being late by one hour, spring forward. She loses memory, but she remembers where the clock is. Yellow swirls, a uh, swirls go down the river. Mountains laugh. Going to bed, listening to thunders. The arch of my right hood hurts. Thank you. Thank you, Miho. Thank you. Um, let's see who's next on the list. Well, skip a few there. Okay, Barry, you're next. Oh, <laughs> took me by surprise. <laughs> well, good evening, everyone. <laughs> Oh, I'm sorry. That wasn't really. <laughs> um, as you all know, my poetry book recently came out, and I've been, thank you for clapping, thank you, been reading a lot from that um, and needed a break from reading from that. So I'm switching tonight to the, ma the manuscript of Micro Memoirs, the one that's titled Barry Who? 33 Unforgettable Micro Memoirs from Someone You Never Heard Of. <laughs> which is wandering around out there getting some very interesting responses. And I picked a, a short piece from it. It's just little incidents from my life. Each one has a date. They're all true and they're unrelated to each other. Two pages at the most. This one isn't even that. August 2019. This is called <clears throat> Rainshine. This was at least the 10th time I noticed the remarkable phenomenon. It was raining behind my house, but not in front. Each time I would sit in my office looking out the back window, pouring, front window, sunshine. It must be the way Hilton Head is, Island is situated. I know it's a barrier island separated from the mainland by about a mile. 
And apparently that affects the way the air currents and therefore storm fronts tend to travel the length of the island's sneaker shape. Perhaps that Hilton Head is almost perfectly dissected by Broad Creek would help explain. <clears throat> or maybe the way Calabogie Sound and Port Royal Sound converge. I researched as much as I could. I even wrote the National Weather Service. They weren't much help about Hilton Head specifically, but did offer several explanations of raining in one spot, but not the other. They even sent videos. In any case, I considered myself luck, kind of lucky that my house on the ninth hole of Dolphin Head Golf Course happens to be in a place where it rains outside one window, but not the other. One day while writing this book, in fact, I was at my desk and here we go again, same phenomenon. I called out to my girlfriend, Kathy, who was reading in the sunroom. Look, I said, pointing outside, it's raining on one side of the house and not the other. She looked toward the back, then leaned forward to get a good look through a front window. I went on, this happens all the time. Uh, Barry, she said, it's like about the 15th time I've seen. Barry, she interrupted. What, I said, a bit annoyed. She wasn't sharing my enthusiasm. That's not rain. That's the sprinkler system on the golf course. I see it here a lot, usually this time of day. I looked out the back, then the front. Hmm, I said. Damn National Weather Service didn't mention that one. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Barry. <laughs> I always enjoy hearing you read. <laughs> Thank you. You always make us laugh. Thank you. All right, let's see who's next on the um, updated list. Surprise, I'm just pulling them out of the hat at this point. Um, oh, Vivian. Okay. If you you want to wait? I can no, move on. No, I'm good. I'm ready. I'm done trying to sell crumb cake. So thank you. You're <laughs> <laughs> Jeez, this is a tough crowd. <laughs> okay, so um, this was uh, published in the Low Country Weekly. So I'm I'm not very inventive here. This is called Being Stuck. Sometimes we just get stuck, paralyzed even, not knowing what next thing to do. And I'm not referring to the simple things, the pile of papers on the floor beside your desk, unanswered mail, a garage busting at the door seams, pleading for organization, shelving and purging. It's the big stuff, losing people and being mired down in grief as the tide recedes from the tsunami of saying goodbye, what's left on the shoreline? Legal documents, medicine, clothing, pictures, all needing to be addressed, dealt with, and confronted. We can be stuck in the paralysis of a sedentary lifestyle with all of its accoutrements of weight gain and stiff joints. Maybe we have writer's block, Maybe we are mired down in debt, addiction, or vice. And then there is the insidious undertow of fear, something hard to identify or face down, but holding us tight, knee deep in pluff mud. Here's a trivial example for my treasure trove of stuckness. After a weekend of nonstop Zoom calls associated with an online conference, I collapsed. I have new plants begging for space in my garden, stacks of papers and books wanting a home on a shelf or in a drawer. And that garage I referred to earlier, it's mine. And it wants to be a garage and not a storage unit. Instead of taking a baby step out of stuck to address the first, next first task, I stretched out on a chaise flipped through magazines, searched for new music on my phone and dozed when the warmth of the sun invited sleep. I followed this up with a movie whose surprise lesson lur lurked behind the arrowed grin of prime video, 
finish what you start and achieve your potential. I kid you not. Quietly filtering through the dusk of my mini Sunday Sabbath was a message in a movie bottle wrapped in digital technicolor film. Finish what you start and achieve your potential. In the final minutes of the movie, as evening quiet settled in, a friend called. She is stuck under layers, work, loss, and financial stress. At the end of our conversation, I asked her how I could help. The word stuck in my throat because asking isn't the same as doing, and distance isn't helping me to help. I often resort to prayer for answers, but sometimes the only voice I hear is the echo of my thoughts intertwined with the screech of tinnitus. So I write. I figure that if I'm stuck, maybe someone else out there is too. Maybe the answer to my prayers is tangled up in words waiting to find a home on the page. Maybe if I write about my stuckness, I'll process it, come up with a plan, get up off my butt and make something happen. And I will, and my friend will. And maybe there is a lesson tucked away in here somewhere for other readers. Just take that first step. Seek the company and love of family, friends, and community. A deep breath and good hydration can serve as a decent substitute in lieu of a loving cheerleading squad of family and friends if family and friends are far away. It's like this. Sometimes the hurdles seem insurmountable. We don't have answers. There are questions that will always remain as questions. As much as I dislike uncertainty, that's where acceptance seeps in and surrender. I struggle with those. Let go, let God, but maybe don't let it alone. Inhale, get up, get dressed, lace up your shoes, finish that cup of coffee, brush your teeth and wash your face. If you do those simple things, you're a lucky dog. And I can't read the last because it's on, this is a family friendly video thing. So the last line is blank being stuck and good luck. Yep, I write poetry too. Hope you're smiling. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> Thank you. We know what the word is, Vivian. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Vivian. I'm stuck too. Me too. Yeah. Yeah. That's all right. I did brush my teeth today though. <laughs> and it shows, Brooke. It's a great okay. <laughs> okay. Good. Um all right, let's see. Um Barb, you're next. You're here. Yeah. I'm actually here to be entertained. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. Well, thank you for being here. Everyone's doing a great job. <laughs> Uh, well, next I have on the list, I think she just showed up. Is it uh, Cassie? Casey. Oh, I don't know. I've never. Hey. Brooke, I'm Casey. It's nice to meet Casey, you. Casey, okay. Nice to meet you. Are you, do you, are you ready to read or? Uh, yeah, I can. Um, okay. I didn't, I didn't time my passage, so um, I don't know if we have like strict two minute or three minute guidelines like before. So this is my first time being here other than when, um, uh, Vivian did this for the conference for the SCWA. Oh yeah, we have a, th a three minute. Um, a three minute, okay. Yeah. It shouldn't yeah. take that long. It okay. shouldn't take that long. Okay, so this is um, a series that I'm publishing on Wattpad. Um, and so I'll put the link in the Zoom so you guys can read the rest of it. Uh, but the name of the series is uh, The Full Moon in Neverland. Chapter Ooh. one, Rejection. You don't look the same, one of the twins said with a dissatisfied snort. Of course I don't, I said. I told you, I'm older and hairier, the other twin said, and stinkier, the first one said. Yes, and older, I said again. So how are we supposed to believe you're him? That was the littlest one. He'd only just arrived before I left and had no way of recognizing me, not really. He wore a gray raccoon costume, a hood with pointed ears, and a long tail with rings of black and white. 
The twins folded their arms over their chests and I looked from them to the little coon and then to the fox curled in the tree and the chubby boy in the bear outfit. He scratched himself. His expression was only mild curiosity, not the hostility of the fox nor the skepticism of the twins. And the raccoon, well, he seemed defensive. So I focused on him. You've heard my story then, have you? I asked him, stumbled off the pirate ship and never seen again. Something like that, he concurred. I knelt in front of him and pulled the evidence I'd brought out of my pocket. Pinching it between my thumb and forefinger, I held it between the raccoon's eyes and mine. The light caught it and made it shine gold for just a second. Then the true color, a sunset's orange, showed, and the fox leapt from the tree. That's mine, he shouted, diving at me. I stood and fainted to the right. He fell to the ground in front of the twins. Now do you believe me? Noah, one of the twins said. Is it really you? I, I said. What happened to you? The other twin said. Told you, I've grown. Grown up, you mean, the little raccoon said. Only a little. Give me back my marble, you. The fox had recovered and charged at me again. I fainted again and he fell against the tree he just leapt from. Enough, Hickory, the raccoon said. You cannot take him, didn't even try. Here, I said, and tossed the marble at the fox. I'd meant to return it. He caught it and met my eyes. Noah, he said softly. Then he flung himself at me and I hugged him tightly to my chest. He was smaller than me now, though we'd been the same height before I left. His wiry arms wound tight around my neck and I remembered the sweaty, dirty scent of him, all of them. I set him away from me and the twins filled the gaps he'd left, then the bear too and the raccoon and then Hickory jumped back on and we all fell into a pile in the shade of the tree. After some tussle, a few tickles and a couple of errant punches that ended in someone's ears being pulled, we all lay about in the shade grinning stupidly at one another. So why did you go? Hickory asked. We'd been bunk mates, Hickory and me, having arrived here around about the same time. My absence must have been hardest on him. On accident, mostly, I said. But then once I'd got gone, I learned. To play there? One of the twins asked. Not play, I said quietly, but something like it. But you grew up, the raccoon protested. It's not all bad, I said. Look, I'm taller than I used to be. What's that matter, he asked. I stood and reached for the rope ladder and tugged it down. You got grown up tall, the bear said. Big deal, Hickory said. I'm stronger than I used to be too, I said. Prove it, the twins challenged that together. And so I grabbed them both and held them up off the ground. Their legs cycled comically as if they were trying to run out of my grasp. Them engines can do that, the bear said. That's perfect, Rocky, Hickory said. Noah can best the natives. Good to have you back. He stood and stretched his hand out. I dropped the twins and shook Hickory's hand. It felt good to be back on the team again. The twins were dusting each other off and the bear, Rocky, was helping the raccoons secure his hood back in place. Let's go find the natives, Hickory said. Show them we got a ringer now. Hey, Noah, Rocky said. Do you still eat the same stuff as before? Sure, I said. Just more of it. And what about sleeping? Will you sleep in Hickory's room again? One of the twins asked. Will you fit in your old hammock? You kept my old hammock, I asked Hickory. He looked away. Never know when someone else will show up. Now you've returned your marbles, Rocky said. Will you be going? That's a great question, said a voice from above us. The six of us looked up. There he was on the highest branch, his hair like a wild flame, his arms and legs taut with the effort of holding himself balanced in the tree. Hello, Peter, I said. Where have you been? I fell off the pirate ship and landed where? London. His eyes narrowed. I'm changed, I said, spreading my arms out wide and showing my bigger, stronger body to him. I'm older. He tilted his head slightly and said, that's what happens in London. I've come back, though. He returned my marble, Hickory said. Peter's gaze didn't leave my face. And you're planning to stay? Of course. Peter jumped from the branch he was on to one just below it. The move was effortless, gentle even. Why should we let you? Peter, it's Noah, Hickory said. Why have you returned? Growing is tiresome. My joints ache, my shins. I thought I may be in for acne, so I decided to escape it. Rocky laughed. His bear suit stretched tight over his belly and he shimmied with the chortle resembling a stuffed teddy. Looking back up at Peter, I felt my pulse start to quicken. You cannot play anymore, he said quietly. 
You cannot giggle or crow or fly. I could never fly. You cannot be a lost boy. You are not lost. I was when I first came here and again in London. And now, now I'm home. Home, Hickory echoed. Home, the twins said together. What's home, the raccoon asked. Peter hadn't looked away from my eyes. Why don't you tell the boys about London, all the fine, shiny things you found there? What do you know of it? My pulse quickened. I could feel myself responding to Peter's rejection. I hadn't thought it'd be easy, but I hadn't thought he'd deny me completely. Why must you, Peter, Hickory said. Our Noah is back and he's changed, Rocky said quietly. Older, one of the twins said. Stronger, the raccoon said. Smellier, the other twin said. I glanced at each of them, my brothers. I'd missed them so when I'd been away. Hickory's quiet stories as we swung in the hammocks before sleep, Rocky's warm pudding pies and sneaking sweets early in the morning before the others woke up, even the twins, Mink and Monk, and the way they leapt over one another and me in our frog game. The raccoon, Shia, I only remembered snuggling with when he first came and was so scared. But the others had all been my brothers, my playmates, my opponents, and my friends. And then I'd stepped off the pirate ship. It's a gift to be here, Peter said, gliding around me, just off the ground, out of reach. I know that now. Peter's is the first voice I remember, the first face, the first eyes. He's the first thing I saw when I got here. And before that, there's nothing. I had been his first, followed shortly by Hickory. I'd been the first to follow him here and where, from wherever we had been before. What happens when you start to want London? I won't. There are no girls here. There's the mermaids, Rocky said. What want have I for girls, I asked. You're older, Peter said. You'll want them. Then he'll take them, Hickory said, like the engines do. He whooped a primal sound. Peter threw a glare at him. I won't want girls, I said. You'll want to leave again. Peter's arms were across his chest, certain and closed. The next time you return, you'll be a man, a pirate maybe. I shook my head. The idea was preposterous. A pirate? Me? Pirates wore eye patches and had peg legs and they growled and stole and slashed rum all over themselves. Do they have pirates in London? Hickory asked. You see, Peter indicated history. Hickory, you're already stealing from them. How, what am I stealing? They shouldn't have to wonder about London or anywhere else. Mm -hmm. They should be satisfied here. We're all satisfied here. I could see the twins nodding in my peripheral view, except me. That's what you mean, isn't it? You think I left on purpose. You think I jumped off that ship. The idea of it made my head spin. Run away, not me. Peter stepped nearer to me so close I couldn't see anything beyond his face. His eyes were wild and glazed on the cusp of crazy and the brink of tears. I felt more than saw the hardness of his jaw as if, he were, if, if, as if his denial were tightening around me. Peter, I said softly, this is my home. He shook his head, it was your home. Now it is our home and your memory. Face to face, close enough to breathe together, Peter's scent of sweat and outdoors filled my nostrils. Don't do this, Hickory piped up. Let him stay. No. Peter turned from me and I felt the absence of him. A rush of cool, unscented air and an overwhelming sense of loss. I'd felt it only once before when I'd fallen headlong over the railing of the pirate ship, when I'd been severed before. Peter, please, I said. Growing up is hard. It's too hard. I don't want to do it anymore. And yet you cannot help what has already begun. I can. Please oh, let God. me stay. I'll suspend. I'll stop. He closed his eyes and took a deep breath. I could feel the tree behind me breathe in with him. I could feel the sea beyond the cliff roll toward us. I could feel the clouds and the sky part and the stars twinkle. Peter, I whispered, please don't do this. Say goodbye, Noah. At least this time you can say goodbye. I turned to Hickory. His eyes shone with tears. Don't say it, Noah. Don't go. Sorry, I don't know if that was really long or not because I didn't time it. I apologize. Thanks, Casey. I'm glad you showed up. Welcome. It's nice. It's nice meeting you. It's nice to meet y'all too. Thank you for letting me read. Thank you, Casey. Can I ask a question? Is that part of a long, uh, like a novella or a series of stories or? It's, uh, it's, um, I think it's going to end up being a novel, but um, I'm posting it on Wattpad one section at a time. It's a little bit of an experiment this summer. I'm trying to see if I can't serialize something. And so this is just a story I've been working on for a while and 
I thought I would just give this one a try. So um, it's up there and right now. I'll share the link. I'll put it in the ch in the chat. It's um, right now about eight parts long. So there's a good maybe 5,000 words there so far. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, so we have Susan and Elizabeth left. I'm sorry, I wanted to ask her what a walk pad was. Did she say a walk pad? Her, Casey? I don't know, I can't hear her. I was gonna ask her what a walk sorry, pad sorry. was. What's a walk so, pad? It's a, it's a website called Wattpad, W-A-T-T-P-A-D. And it's where you can um, publish your work and there's a whole group of readers already there. And most of the readers are a lot younger, uh, but you can publish, you can serialize your work there. So I just put the link there. This is for just chapter one. I don't think you have to have an account just to read on there. I think you can just click on it and start reading it. Um, but if you wanted to publish there, you have to have an account to publish there. Okay, thank you. Oh, it's interesting. Now, this is a little longer, but not that long. So um, this is uh, from Africa. Um, among Men, November 14, 2008, into Africa, I fly on a one-way ticket, journey through 14 countries in 22 months on local transportation, learn, rest, change, a woman without advantage of youth or money, the journey has many pieces. December 2nd, 2008, Tunisia, to Zaire, to Seuss, 239 miles, family ties, the Louange travels north out of sweet Sahara. Itchy thrill of the road, salt ponds glistened, land greens, occasional villagers bored, cut the air with Arabic chatter. Not many go to the Mediterranean in dead winter. Road bends east toward the sea, temperature drops sharply. I pull on, pull the loose woolly barnoose over my black clothes. Passengers and driver eye me. Woman wears Barnoose, cloak of the Tunisian man. Coastal, ga coastal fishery of games, I await transfer. On stone bench in front of cheap eatery, sip red tea, nibble biscuits. Nothing moves on gray streets, cold sea breeze ignores sunlight. Transfer arrives, my, my seat behind the driver faces a longer one, occupied by the only other passenger, an Arab family, wife huddles next to husband, small black bird, wing around straight back sun. Directly across from me, husband spreads square compact bulk, half closes eyes, speaks flawless English. You wear a Tunisian man's cloak. I smile, yes. Rugged golden cliffs roar by, wild waves of winter sea, sand beach where Muslim women take summer swims still veiled in black from head to toe. You must be from America. I smile, yes. Only an American woman wear a barnoose, rash laugh. Wife titters vacantly, lonesome giggle from the sun. Husband leans closer, sweat glistens upper lip. Have you been to this coast before? Again, I smile, no. Where are you going? Seuss. Ah, my via is much better. A dream setting, gorgeous sea views, shaded gardens behind high walls, a beautiful patio, just a half mile down the road. I perform another smile. A hidden private pool where you can swim. He rubs fingers over his damp upper lip, stares at my bare wrist. You will relax at my via a few days before you go on to Seuss. He nods, wife and son nod. My cheeks hurt from smiling. I have a boyfriend in Seuss. Husband leans back, sighs. Wife and son sigh. It dawns on me. Neither wife nor son speak or understand English. Muslim family pattern, old as earth. They get out at the, at the turn. 
Seuss, Tunisia, summer resort town on the Mediterranean Sea, narrow rooming house, pitch dark lobby. A man behind the front desk sends a growl to the thick set woman bent to her bucket on the stairs. The woman straightens, offers a worn smile. Hello, I am Mara. Are you looking for a room? Yes, thank you. Mara leaves her bucket, leads me up the stairs. The room has pink lampshades, crisp white linen. Out the window, tiled rooftops spread to meet hazy lines of green grade sea. Beautiful, Marwa. Will you consider cut rates for a 30 day stay? The man at the front desk is my husband. Abdul handles the money. He speaks only a little English, but will understand. We go down to the desk. An Arabic snarl from Abdul whips Mara back to the, her bucket on the stairs. I say, Ikirahan, Ikirahan, Arabic for proposal. See. Abdul stands as tall as possible on stunted legs, writes a number. I cross it out, write a lower number. He grandstands in Arabic. I smile in English. Mara listens from the stairs. Sweat curls stringy hairs atop his balding head. He grumbles agreement, crafty to realize profit of long winter stays at a summer resort. A local girl enters, just old enough to take the veil. Abdul puffs, hollow courtesy. Marwa grasps mop and bucket, turns up the stairs. I follow her. Brassy laughs and girlish giggles canter after us. Mara whispers, Allah commands my husband not to hit my face. He does. Not to call me ugly. He does. Rubs rough hands together. That child downstairs? Abdul takes her as his second wife. A trust from Allah. They will marry soon. My wedding gift to his second bride will be the mop and bucket. Smile scamper through her liquid eyes. Allah be praised. <laughs> Thank you, Susan. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, let's see. Elizabeth, are you ready? Just what I always wanted a mop and bucket. <laughs> Um, I was just going to read one short poem, but then Vivian was talking about being stuck. And um, this actually makes a nice uh, contrast piece to uh, the poem I'm gonna read because um, this is the first poem in my first book. I wrote it um, in November of 2015, when I was sitting next to my uh, husband in his hospital bed, and it was the day I figured out he probably wasn't going to make it. And the poem is titled Stuck. I used to watch the raindrops trickle across the window, making shapes and tracks as we traveled the Alps or slept to school. The hours spent studying each tiny sphere, its motion squiggling diagonally across the glass in mini jumps, its lifespan fitting neatly the length of that rear window. How much of my childhood I spent watching, listening, feeling, waiting. I'd sit and study an ant as it hauled some cargo back to somewhere, its purpose hidden but compelling. I'd stare at waves folding onto a rocky Capri shore, the crystalline teal water mesmerizing, a warm and salty tang. I'd cluster with the neighborhood pack and roam from Sledding Hill to Corner Grocer, collecting bubble gum and tops cards. Now, I scurry in a mindless triptych to vacuous or unfulfilled destinations our front yards and parks emptied 
endless inning pickup games as lost as that one stubborn raindrop that clings to the far corner, quivering, shaken, yet refusing to move. Ooh. Yeah, I was in a pretty bad place, so I stuck. Yeah. Yeah. So this poem, <laughs> I'm reading it to you because I, I need to, to like hear it. Um, it went through a rather heavy revision last night after I had been working with um, the uh, South Carolina Writers Association Poetry Group on a Zoom session um, led by Len Lawson. And um, I figured out nobody, nobody, like I got incredible feedback and realized no one knew what I was getting at. So there was something <laughs> really wrong with the poem, which I, I knew when I brought it. So, um, so this is a new version. Uh, and I think a nice contrast to where I was five years ago. Curtain call. The glory of a grand finale outshines the story. Electric days arc into deep color, soften to muted tones. We gape, orient our homes to catch the angled sun dipping into the bay, schedule cocktails to glimpse the show over salt marsh, rush to the beach for the drama expanding the sky. The deepest hues just before dark reflect transition, golden umber to rose, purple, a creeping gray. Applaud the full, full circle, that divine intervention stretched beyond time, wrapped in quiet. Thank you, Elizabeth. I think we have Catherine who's joined us now. Are you gonna read for us? Yes, I'd love to. All right. <laughs> okay. This is a flash fiction and it's called Flashback. Arcadia, California, June 1997. Austin is my missing piece. He was the boy, the son I'd always wanted. In my mind, he's still here. I can't stop thinking about him, about all he meant to me. No matter how hard I try, I can't fill the space that ought to be him. His eyes were gray like mine. He was lean, lanky, and starting to spurt up like a bean sprout. Ridley's smile is wistful. He sighs. His head drops as if to examine the toe of his dusty boot. Only 38, he's had a full head of white hair since his 20s. Like his father, he wouldn't like the comparison. He's perched atop a hay bale in the aisle of his barn of thoroughbreds at Santa Anita Racetrack. His right hand loosely grasps the lead shank of a horse who stands with its left leg in a large bucket of ice. The flashy bay three-year-old had returned from a morning workout with a swollen knee again and an hour's worth of ice has always brought the swelling down. Most trainers prefer their grooms to ice a horse, but Ridley always steps up to that task himself. He likes spending quiet time in the barn with his horses. The occasional whinnies, stomps, munching of hay, swishing of tails to swat at flies. They always give him a measure of comfort. The man wipes his eyes with his free left hand, looks up and continues. I remember that morning, Austin had the school had a school holiday and had come with me to the track. He loved hanging around horses at Santa Anita and at the ranch. That boy had a gift with animals. It was like he and they had known each other from another life before this one. Till that kid started talking, I never believed in that kind of stuff. The wisdom that came from his mouth, even when he was little, no question in my mind, Austin was an old soul, taught me what that means. We'd just eaten blueberry pancakes with butter and maple syrup. He wolfed down a whole stack. I always told him he must have a hollow leg with all the food he stuffed in his skinny nine-year-old body. Made him laugh. The memory brings Ridley a small smile. The track kitchen was his favorite place. Other trainers, jocks, owners would stop by our table. Austin couldn't get enough of horse talk. And he remembered it all, just like his old dad. 
The smile fades. The man continues. I pulled out onto the highway and stopped the F-150 at a traffic light. He was telling me all about his time earlier that morning, how Mac had let him ride the lead pony up to the main track and back, line up with the trainers for a bit, how much fun he'd had. Those eyes of his just lit up. The light changed to green. I stepped on the gas and was halfway through the intersection when a car ran that light, never even slowed down and slammed into the passenger side of the truck. Spun us around the intersection. I'll never forget that sound, loudest I ever heard. When we finally skidded to a stop, I looked over at Austin and reached for him. His blood was everywhere, on the windshield, the dash, the seat. How could a child bleed so much? Tears spring to Ridley's eyes. His head drops again. The horse he's holding gives a gentle snort and shakes its head. Reflex guides his hand up to pat its neck. For a moment, the trainer doesn't move. Then another swipe at his tanned face. He looks up, clears his throat to release the choke in his voice. I wrapped my arms around him. Hang on, son. Hang on, son. Hang on, son, was all I could say. He opened his eyes. Blood was all over his face. Dad, he said. Those sweet gray eyes were full of pain and looked to me to make it better. And then they closed again and he was gone, just like that. I couldn't do anything. Tears now stream down Ridley's cheeks and he lets them. Pain etches his face with grief. The barn is quiet, still as death. The drunk driver landed in jail for the fourth time. He had to pay a big fine, but nothing will ever bring my boy back, nothing. Wow. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. You're welcome. All right, I think that's it for, well, yeah. Everyone, I guess now it's time to introduce our featured writer and reader. What, did I miss someone? You broke when you can read. Oh, I'm not going to read. What? <laughs> I'm not going to read. best reader? <laughs> nope, I'm not reading. <laughs> not tonight. <Yeah. laughs> um, but I will introduce our next uh, uh, writer and reader, Rick Campbell. Um, I first uh, became familiar with Rick's work when I was an undergraduate at Valdosta State University. Uh, my poetry professor, Marty Williams, had introduced me to Rick's work, <laughs> and uh, I fell in love with the work, and then I started going to writers' conferences all around Florida and Alabama and <laughs> D.C., and I made a habit of stalking Rick <laughs> <laughs> at all these conferences, so I was actually going through some photos earlier, Rick, and there was all these photos of me and you, and it said a conference where I'm like, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I found Rick. <laughs> But um, anyway, and I would always request that he play his harmonica. Uh, he's a lover of music, baseball and dogs, among other things. So thanks for being here. But I am going to read Rick's uh, actual bio. It's better than what I just said. But that's how I know Rick. <laughs> uh, Rick Campbell is a poet and essayist living on Alligator Point, Florida. His most recent collection of poems, Providence, by Blue Horse Press, He's published six other poetry books, Gunshot Peacock Dog, The History of Steel, Dixmont, Setting the World in Order, The Traveler's Companion, and A Day's Work. His poems and essays have appeared in many journals, including the Georgia Review, Fourth River, Kestrel, and Prairie Schooner. He's won a Pushcart Prize and an NEA Fellowship in Poetry. He served as the director of Anhinga Press and the Florida Literary Arts Coalition one of the places where I stalked him. He teaches in the Sierra Nevada University MFA program. <laughs> Thank you, Rick. Thanks, Brooke. I have this philosophy of um, passive availability, so I'm, I can't figure out why you never caught me. <laughs> um, this first poem is um, a villanelle. I haven't read it for a long time, so I thought maybe that we'll have some music here. It was also turned into a, um, a song. It's, you'll never hear it because it's a 
a guy who's not on Spotify, so you'd have to come down here to hear it. But but it is cool to every now and then on my iPad or my Spotify account, it'll come up when I'm not looking, and I'll I'll hear this and I'll go, God, that's pretty good. And then I remember I wrote it because when Michael turned it into a song, it, you know, he didn't do it in the order in which I wrote it, and um, it's quite possible it's better the way he did it. But anyway, it's called um, Elegy, and it's um, it's more or less about where I grew up in a kind of semi-fantastic way. I taught for a long time, and I had my students read it once without putting my name on it, so they they wouldn't feel embarrassed, and 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 they thought it was about a guy who'd fallen in love and got burnt so often he wasn't going to ever be in love again, and I'm like. Where'd you get that? Who's your teacher? Get out of here. So anyway, it's called Elegy. Um, and I, I guess you know the, the villanelle form. You'll hear the rhyme scheme and the repetition as it goes. Close the bus terminal. Shut the train depot down. Barricade all roads leading home. Too many of us come back to this town. We sit in these cheap beer bars and drown the clean and shining places we have known. Close the bus terminal, shut the train depot down. We follow roadmaps like dreams. We've been around. The world couldn't keep us from straggling home. Too many of us come back to this town. We live here where we were always bound. Steel towns have ways of calling home their own. Close the bus terminal shut the train depot down. Protect us from ourselves, the siren sound lures our swing shift blood with its one pitch tone. Too many of us come back to this town. We are veterans returning from the road, surround us with soot and ash, the coal barges slow moan. Close the bus terminal, shut the train depot down. Too many of us come back to this town. Perhaps the most famous Villanelle, you know, is Dylan Thomas's Do Not Go Gentle into that good night, in case you're still wondering what a Villanelle sounds like, because mine didn't work. You know? um, this is from the new book, which I don't know if you can see this, it doesn't show up on my screen, but um, the book Prominence. And, um, uh, a friend of mine wrote and said, if it, we were to pick a picture of um, from this classic collection of photos from of Tampa and write a poem in reaction to the photo. And, and I thought, I'll give that a try. And I listened to music about eight, I don't work anymore. I don't do anything. And I, um, so I was listening, I listened to a lot of Jason Isbell for that week and um, he has this great song. And so the epigraph is from a, the Isbell song. It says, so high the street girls wouldn't take my pay. They said, come see me on a better day. She just danced away. And I was thinking about that. And, um, and so the poem is Ybor City, which is a, a Cuban section of Tampa. So the poem is called Ybor City on a Friday. And then that epigraph. I've never had a street girl, high or straight, never a drug habit, not a drunkard either. I have no indecent crutch for my failures. I've studied most sins at a distance. In this new old age, if I'm a tattered man on a stick, I've come here through my own neglect. On this bench, I watch the street girls. They know I can't pay, still they smile. Our hearts go out to each other like pigeons, picking the park clean. Blessed are warm nights, curse the rain and mosquitoes. The understory below the banyan feels safe, though rats and roaches rattle thick leaves like those punk bullies who cruise the park at night. I would die in Pittsburgh, bent into a corner door. We know to come south, new era pioneers, not looking for the dream, just to sleep and wake when the streetcars clack past. 
The gas company lights are stars in a heaven we'll find wanting someday. The photo that I chose was of, uh, it was a Tampa skyline. It had the smokestacks and all that. This poem is from an older book. The book's called Setting, Setting the World in Order. And um, the poem's called The Geography of Desire. It's sort of, uh, oh, it is not sort of, it's a, an unrequited love poem written over miles and miles and miles of geography. And um, <clears throat> I only knew this one for one day, so it's a little bit unfair to think she should have run away with me anyway, but you can't blame a guy for trying. And um, so in the poem, I imagine that it's sort of, I call it, poetic determinism. If I wrote a poem, write a poem about something happening, it will happen. And so um, in the poem, I, I steal her. It didn't work, you might suppose, but still. <laughs> so geographically, the poem begins in Cambridge and goes into the Caribbean and, and ends in uh, fantasy, I guess. The geography of desire. If you insist on history, it was Cambridge, 1977. The door of your flat closed and you disappeared into the life you thought yours. I walked streets caked with winter's last snow. Spring came that night, though there was little reason to notice, nothing to believe. For years, I made you every dark haired woman in the streets of Montreal, a bar in St. Croix. I carried you with me until now, the moment when our lives break loose like sailboats slipping their moorings. For years I have practiced stealing you, those nights when you dreamed of flying over a land green with magnolia and water oak, when you woke damp sea air on your neck, when for two days every time you closed your eyes you saw the Atlantic. I did that. Those split shot seconds when you turned a corner and everything danced, then settled. You were living on the border. I've honed desire beyond time and space and bent geography into a new world. This cartography of the heart is stronger than any map that says Tucson, any phone book that says Cali Madrid. Forget that other life. It's just a hole between the last time I saw you and now this life our life. Ooh. Thank y'all. I don't know how much time I have. Can I, you want me to read another? Yeah. All right. Yes, one, please. Thank you. Thank you. I grew up around Pittsburgh. That's I should have said that since Pittsburgh seemed to show up in a lot of those poems. I did too. Who said that? Vivian. Hi, Vivian. Um, I went to, when I finally did quit hitchhiking and went to school and I went to the University of Florida in Gainesville. And, and of course I was the only person from Pittsburgh. So I wrote about Pittsburgh and the mills and the Ohio river. And it made it sound like I knew what I was talking about even though I didn't. But, but I wrote so often about Pittsburgh and the Ohio river that I was banned from writing about either of them for three weeks. For three weeks, I had to come to a workshop with no Pittsburgh poem. It almost killed me. But this poem takes place here in um, North Florida. And um, there are a lot, of, a lot of dogs in the poem, though none of them are Jasper. They're pre-Jasper pre dogs. Um, and it's, it's called Alligator. Um, I mean, I know you have alligators in South Carolina, but a little bit of this is that idea when you go to a swimming place and they have the buoy ropes and they say, don't go outside the buoy ropes because the alligators are out there. And you're like, yeah, shit, man, the alligators will come in here if they want to. And, and, but you go swim there anyway, because you somehow trust the, somebody, the state, somebody, whoever put up those ropes. So this is me with four or five dogs swimming in a place full of alligators. 
there's a certain tension that comes from that. And of course, because I couldn't think of a better title, it's called Alligator. There is no alligator when the first dog chases a bird in the water. No alligator when you wade in, silt and mud warm as July. No alligator you can see as you hold your daughter's hand. There's no alligator for the first 20 minutes, though a cooter almost has you gathering everyone to shore. There's always an alligator you can feel. You don't need the warning sign to make you believe. Then outside the buoy rope, the arbitrary boundary of your world and theirs, the alligator drifts. You look hard, you want it to be a log, but you know it's the alligator you've been waiting for. You know you should not have come here, dogs and daughter in tow. You know luck is just a reprieve. You send your daughter to the shore, hold the lab by her thick roll of yellow fur. The alligator rides outside the rope, closes the gap only a few feet. Dogs leashed, you climb the hill to the car. You drive home, listening to the valves tick too loudly, to the air leaking out of your tires, to the brakes wearing toward failure. The world's alligator is there, slit eyes just above the green water. Yay, that was great. Thanks. Well, I have 900 more poems, but I've probably exhausted my time. So thank you all for inviting me. <laughs> A dog. Who's thank you, Rick. That's Jane. She's, uh, she's saying good job. A fan. <laughs> <laughs> she's she waited till the end so you got to give her that <laughs> well trained dog <laughs> yeah hold on just, hold on just a okay. thank you rick thank you thanks for inviting me I had fun yeah i so miss hearing you read and you know given well, the time know. i haven't been able to stalk you at conferences lately so you this know. has been nice you know where I live. You know where I live almost. You know. Yep. Yep. I'll have to come see you. You're going to tell me to play the harmonica? Absolutely. I should tell you. Okay. <laughs> Oh, more, more. Oh, who's doing it? Jasper usually leaves when I do that. You know. Oh, he does? He doesn't like the harmonica? <laughs> I don't know. Critics are everywhere. Critics. Maybe he really liked it. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you all for coming tonight. And um, like I said, thank you again, Rick, for joining us and doing this. And um, you guys, if you uh, want to become familiar with a wonderful poet, you should read some of Rick's work. I've got all these books here and they're, they're, uh, I've been reading them over and over for years and years and years. So all right. great work. Thank you. And where's, okay. Uh, thank you all for coming. And uh, I guess we'll see you next month, hopefully. <laughs> cool. if, all, if all goes well. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Brooke, for hosting. Thank you, Brooke. Thank you. Yeah, it was nice meeting you, and okay. thanks, everyone, for coming to read. It was a lot of beautiful work tonight, and I look forward to seeing you all next month, and uh, maybe we can get Vivian to host again. <laughs> yeah.
<laughs> I, I, hit her, I hit her up today. <clears throat> I hit her up today. I was like, hey, I'm going to be at open mic tonight. I can't wait to see you. And she goes, I don't think I'm going to be at open mic tonight. And I was like, what? 